All right, I should be able to share my screen. Yes. Maritza, did you want us to start or did you want to wait a couple of minutes? We'll, we'll go off of your queue. As I was muted. Um, I think there's a, a little few people coming in. Maybe I'll give it a minute or two. Okay. Perfect. We'll wait for a while. Have your students taken your final their finals already for the spring term? No, we don't have finals until the last week in May. Okay. So they still got a couple weeks to go. Yeah. I actually had a, a group of students I took to Florence for, um, we had two weeks in Florence and three weeks in Rome. So I actually was in Florence when they had that big, it's kind of like they've got the four different colors and they have oh. that, what do you, they call that thing? <laughs> it the, the like historic, it. Was it the historic soccer match? Yeah, yeah, the, the soccer summer? without the rules, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 500 that's years. years. <laughs> it's, um, it's a really interesting time to be in Florence, I have to say. It, the, yeah. the final, I guess for other colleagues on the call that may not be familiar with it. So it's this uh, historic soccer match that is actually conducted in, with these historical costumes. And it's a throwback to the couple centuries ago when uh, Emperor Charles V was marching towards Florence. A lot of the Florentine nobles basically wanted to um, show their subversive, uh, non-approving attitude and stance towards the emperor. And so they would be outside when it was past curfew and, and kick around a ball in, in street squares, right? So it was actually meant to be a politically sub subversive kind of action. And that, but on the other hand, what's interesting about this moment is that it kind of gave birth to the sport of soccer. Um, so it's kind of funny because Florence, when, when one is here, you tend to hear about all these things that were invented in Florence. And so, I mean, things that are part of daily life, soccer, the piano, ice cream, um, yeah. perspective and architecture and, 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 and the visual arts and design, um, lots of different things. And so, but the... As, as we were mentioning before, the since the a very kind of specific version of this historic soccer matches, but it's kind of actually more of a mix between soccer, rugby, and football, and it can be pretty violent. Um, yeah. there, there, are, there are rules, but a lot of times the, the game gets suspended because uh, the players start to get very rowdy. And uh, the four colors, um, there are four teams, and they kind of move their way through the final playoff game, which is always on June 24th for the patron saint of Florence, St. John. And uh, each team and slash color represents one of the historic neighborhoods yeah. of Florence. And so it gets very, the, the rivalry gets very intense. Yeah, everybody is bandaged up the day after the game. <laughs> I remember yeah. that. <laughs> okay. Good. I think, I don't see- but It's around now, isn't it? Coming in. Um, so we could, we could start if you guys are ready. Sure. Okay. Perfect. Can so, everybody see my, yes, yes. my screen? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. All right. So this lecture or a seminar will talk about the hospitality industry in Firenze, a little bit about in Italy, pre-COVID, post-COVID, and then what we are doing as FUA, how we are taking part in the, in the hospitality industry in the city. So let's start with the table of contents. So I'm going to do a brief um, explanation of the history of Florence. Uh, we're going to look at tourism in Italy in numbers before uh, the pandemic, the hospitality sector in general before the pandemic, and then look at the renaissance of hospitality, um, how Italy is trying to improve the sector right now, what the tourists are asking from Firenze, and on the other hand, what the locals are asking from the tourists. And then finally, we'll talk about 
um, FUA, our school, and its mission. Right. So looking into the history of Florence, um, Firenze was founded in 59 BC as one of Julius Caesar's colonies. Now it already existed before it in a sense, but this is when it really started to be built as, as a city eventually. We move on to the 13th and the 14th century, which is when Firenze had started to become a more important city with more power. And at this point you had empowered the Guelphs and the Ghibellines. And they were two um, opposing families that really had a violent uh, bloody fight over the power in Firenze. And they're very important families, even today, two of, you could say, the main streets in the historical center of Firenze is Via Ghibellina and Via Guelfa, uh, named by, by these two, after these two families. In um, 1265, uh, Dante Alighieri was born, a very important figure in the history of Florence. And in uh, 1296, um, already started the construction of the Duomo, Florence's uh, main cathedral under Arnolfo di Cambio. Now I say it started because it wasn't actually finished until decades later um, because they couldn't figure out how to actually make the dome without it falling, uh, falling down, without it falling apart. In the 14th century, uh, Firenze generated a wealthy merchant class that grew up around a uh, wool trade here in the city. And this is from this wealth that was generated is really where the seeds of the Renaissance were sown and the Renaissance was allowed to begin with all its heart, uh, art and uh, culture. In 1434, Cosimo de' Medici gains power in Firenze and becomes one, one of the most legendary um, leaders of, of Florence. And he was very big into arts and supported the arts industry with a lot of, um, a lot of enthusiasm. And under him, the Duomo is finally completed by Brunelleschi, an architect in 1436. Then we skip a large part of the history. Um, we end up in 1865 to 1870, when Firenze was actually the capital of Italy for five years. It ended up then being changed with the unification of Italy and Rome. Um, Rome became the, the new capital of Italy until, of course, today. But for a brief, brief five years there, we were, we were the capital of Italy. And where are we today? Um, today, Firenze holds 60% of the world's art heritage. Um, the last heir of the Medici bloodline, Anna Maria Luisa de' Medici, she uh, didn't have any children. And what she actually did in her will, she left all the art that the Medici family had to the city of Firenze. This way, the art stayed in Firenze, it stayed in the city, and it wasn't sold um, to other countries and it wasn't allowed to leave uh, the city of Firenze, which is one of the big reasons why today Firenze still has so much art. Firenze is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So it's very much protected and um, appreciated, you could say. Let's look at uh, tourism in Italy in general. Now, these are of course numbers before um, the pandemic. So tourism accounts for 13% of the GDP. Uh, this is indirectly, 5% of directly tourism accounts for the 5% of GDP. The sector directly employs 2 million people and indirectly over 4 million people. And it has contributed over 236 billion euros to the uh, economy in 2019. Now, of course, all these numbers drastically dropped 
um, in the past, past two years. However, they are expected to reach their similar levels in 2024. In 2019, they were um, forecasting a 4% increase yearly. So we're hoping to eventually get back to that. A little bit more about tourism. Uh, Italy is the fifth most visited country in international arrivals. And it has uh, 94 million tourists per year and 2017.7 million foreign visitors nights spent. This is in all of Italy, right? <coughs> so let's look at how Firenze did uh, before COVID. Firenze is the eighth largest city in Italy in population size. It's actually not a very big city. We have around 350,000 um, citizens who live in the city, and then the rest are pretty much uh, tourists. In 2018, Florence was visited by over 27.7 million people. These tourists um, spent quite a lot of money, I would say, in a day. Um, the average, uh, average expenditure is 135.9 euros which then totals to more than 3 billion euros per year. So tourism is, is a very important sector, not only in, in Italy, but especially in Firenze. Who, who is the person who visits uh, Florence? The median age is about 42.7 years, and the average tourist travels mainly in pairs, so we see a lot of couples or in the family. Now, you will see throughout this presentation that this is uh, starting to change in the pre-COVID um, world. But before COVID, it was mainly um, middle-aged uh, couples or families that visited Florence. So how does Firenze compare to other cities in Italy when it came to uh, tourism? Four cities in Italy are among the 100 most popular destinations worldwide, and these cities are Rome, Milan, Venice, and Florence. Rome ranked uh, 17th on the list with over 10 million tourists visiting, and Firenze ranked uh, 52nd with over 5 million tourists. Now, Milan and Venice ranked, um, I think, 40th and 42nd, but as you can see, Firenze is still a very important um, tourism city in Italy, and especially as the capital of Tuscany, um, the most important one in Tuscany. Other cities such as Pisa are not, uh, are not necessarily places where people stay as much. Fun story, I actually moved myself to Firenze in the middle of the pandemic. Um, I moved here in the summer of uh, 2020 and my family has been visiting Florence since I was six years old and I had always seen Florence full of tourists and full of life and uh, lines everywhere left and right and when I moved here it was um, almost a culture shock coming to Firenze that was very much empty and in the summer tourism had already restarted, not necessarily um, outside of the EU, but at least from the EU. Um, but it was still very, very, very quiet. I remember I went to the Uffizi gallery and uh, I have been there before twice and I have never actually really necessarily been able to see the art because there's a sea of people in front of me. And this time I was able to go throughout the whole museum with maybe three other people in the whole um, in the whole museum. So it was definitely an experience. And then throughout the two years that I have lived here, I have seen the tourists return and uh, come back and slowly, slowly the lines are getting a little bit longer and the piazzas are getting a little bit busier. But um, working in the hospitality industry, of course we are all uh, very happy about it and very much expecting for them to 
to come back. So the tourism post COVID, um, if you look at the numbers before 2020, obviously we had a very sharp uh, drop in uh, 2020. There were still tourists, there were still around um, 3 million tourists that visited Florence, which is of course a very large number. And in um, 2021, it rised by 60% and you had 5.4, million tourists um, visiting Florence. Now, I'm uh, originally from Finland and our whole country has 5 million people, uh, population of 5 million people. So of course, in one year, having 5.4 million tourists is a big number, an important number. Uh, we are a small city, so it definitely makes an impact but you look at 2019 when the number was over 15 million and rising. So this is um, the reality of where we are now at 5.4 million tourists. Uh, this year, it's they're already made some expectations for it to reach around eight to 10 million tourists, remains to be seen. Um, and then hopefully by 2024, we would um, come back to pre-COVID levels of tourism. So who visits uh, Florence? This year, the largest amount of visitors have come from Germany and then followed by France and then United Kingdom, uh, United States, China, Japan, and South Korea. Now, before COVID, um, United States was the largest source of tourism. We had over 706,000 tourists come from United States and it made around 40% of tourism in, um, in Firenze. And it was followed closely by China. And then a smaller portion of tourists came from uh, EU countries. This completely changed, of course, during COVID with um, um, people not being allowed to leave their continents, not allowed to enter EU, EU not allowed to uh, leave EU. So people started to do more uh, traveling within the EU. And then since we didn't have as many people visiting from the States, uh, we now see more tourism that are from the EU, such as Germany, France, and United Kingdom. Um, Russian tourists visited a lot before the COVID. They haven't really started to come back yet. I think they are now only at 3% of the tourists of Firenze, whereas before they used to make around 10% of um, all tourists who arrived in Firenze. So you can see, of course, again, a sharp drop still in the amount of tourism going from 706,000 in the States to 33,000 from the States. Um, China, Chinese tourism dropping from 348,000 to 29,000. But it's slowly, slowly, slowly coming back. But let's talk about not the numbers, but what are the expectations of tourism today? So on one, one hand, we have what the tourists expect from um, Firenze and from Italy in general. And then on the other hand, we have what the locals expect of the tourism and how the pandemic has shaped and changed the locals' expectations. Looking at the tourist side, uh, we see a sharp increase in younger tourists. So like I said before, before COVID, the average, um, the average tourist was around 42.7 years old. And not, right now we are seeing an increase in younger people traveling. So the average um, tourist right now is around 25 years old. Now, this is of course interesting because Firenze is a city of art, culture, so it has always kind of easily catered to an older, older clientele. Right now, the city has to re-innovate itself and make itself perhaps more young and uh, more hip in that way that the young tourists will also find things to enjoy. Of course, art is being part of that. 
but um, different things. So what you saw last, uh, last year, last fall, they made innovations such as more um, putting more importance on nightlife, for example, and uh, on the other hand, on different events such as festivals, um, open air music festivals, open air film festivals. So really trying to cater more to this new profile of tourists that is arriving to Florence. On the other hand, the tourists uh, care more about the quality and depth of time and their experiences. So they are looking for more quality experiences and more of an authentic tourism experience. So whereas before um, a lot of tourists came to Firenze, they weren't necessarily looking for this super authentic Italian Florentine experience. This is right now what a lot of people are looking for. On the other hand, this goes hand in hand with getting out of the cities sort of tourism. A lot of tourists are looking into maybe staying in Firenze, but um, going out into the countryside, visiting the more smaller villages and um, getting that sort of more authentic experience of, of Italian life rather than just staying in Firenze and uh, visiting Firenze and maybe going to Pisa or other cities nearby. This is again important for us because we need to realize how we can cater to this type of, uh, of tourism, of interest that people have. There's a lot more um, tourism companies that for example now offer daily visits to um, different smaller uh, villages, cities, towns near Florence. And they will have packages where they can stay in Florence and then go out for uh, daily excursions. And these excursions can happen between a day and two. Then on the other hand, we have the side of the locals. Now, when the pandemic, before the pandemic, if you went to the city center of Florence, you didn't really see that many locals. During the pandemic, when all the tourists left, locals kind of started to take back these, um, these places and you would find them in the city center and they didn't just stay in the background of the city, so to speak. So right now with the tourism coming back, you have this idea of we want the tourists back as long as they do not sit on our statues. We want the tourism back because it's good for our city. But at the same time, we want to be able to enjoy our city and not be bombarded everywhere we go by these tourists. We want the tourists to be respectful of our city. We want them to be respectful of the space, of the art, the culture, and the Italian way, and of course, the locals. And this was something that before COVID was almost, you could say, lost a bit. Everything was maybe done more to please the tourists. And now it's more of a conversation between what pleases the locals and what we can do to boost um, tourism. And this is where FUA is um, coming along and is making an impact. It's about uh, bridging the gap between the tourism and the local community. So FUA and the School of Hospitality at Picius, it's a university situated in Florence. So we have uh, buildings all around the Florence city center. And these buildings are divided into different departments. Today, we're going to talk about the hospitality department at Picious and how Apicius uh, especially tries to bridge this gap between tourism and the community and how we work and what we can do for the exchange students to have a memorable experience here in Florence with us. So what do we do? Um, FUA takes part in experiential learning through the CEMI. What is experiential learning and what are the CEMI? Experiential learning means uh, learning outside of a classroom in our experiential learning laboratories. Now, these can take different forms. Um, for culinary students, it would be 
the kitchen, the back of house within a restaurant. And for front of house hospitality management students, it would be, for example, the actual restaurant and working in the restaurant. Chemis uh, are these buildings, these locations that we have that offer the experiential learning. And CHEMI stands for Community Engagement Member Institutions. For the hospitality industry, we have three main ones. We have Fedora, Ganzo, and Fly that I will introduce you uh, introduce to you in, in a second. But why is um, this experiential learning so important and why is it so interesting? It's really a unique um, opportunity, a unique um, experience that FUA offers when, especially when it comes to the hospitality industry, I personally believe as does our school that you cannot learn everything in a classroom. It's a very hands-on jobs that these students want to um, achieve when they come out of school and having experience in working in these careers will help them eventually achieve that. So the experiential learning really is a core part of, of, of what we do as an institution in the hospitality industry. And it's all allowed to be done through the CHEMIS, through the community engagement member institution. First, we have Fedora, Sorgiva, and Dimora. This is a CHEMI that is situated in the main building of the hospitality department. It's around three minutes from the Duomo, so very much in the city center. And this CHEMI is divided into three, you could say three um, categories, three departments, if you will. Fedora, which is our bistro. So in the bistro works three types of experiential students. We have culinary students who work in the kitchen and provide a light, light lunch menu and an aperitivo. We have pastry students who provide pastries each morning. And then we have front of house students who provide all the services within the CHEMI. So we make the drinks, we carry out the food, we are organize events, etc. Then we have in the same building, Sorgiva, which is our spa. And in here you can find um, our spa management experiential learning students at work. Obviously they don't perform the actual uh, treatments, but they are in charge of all the bookings. They are in charge of setting the place, how to prepare it, the mise en place, and how to end the, the treatment session. Then finally we have Dimora, which is our sort of um, hotel bed and breakfast, if you will. We have three apartments within the, the building that are fully serviced apartments. They have a kitchen, a bathroom, a living room area and bedroom that anybody can rent out. So it's also open for tourists um, who want to stay in Florence. And here you can find um, housekeeping students, for example, um, doing their experiential learning. They will take care of, again, the bookings, the check-ins, the check-outs, and then everything that goes, goes in between. <clears throat> Another chemi that we have is Ganzo, and this is more of a fine dine and wine chemi, also situated in the city center of Florence, though a little bit more, I would say, in a local neighborhood. Now, Ganso means cool in um, Florentine slang. And it's really trying to represent the idea again of FUA. Now, whereas Fedora is a bistro and a bit more casual, Ganso is where our students can really learn to be part of this fine dining experience. Here you can find working um, in the back of house our culinary students who are usually already in the master level and in the front of house, our front of house students. We also have here working wine and beverage management students because uh, Ganso offers a wider wine selection, for example. So our students can be part of the wine service, the wine recommendation, creating the wine list according to the food that we offer. 
also in all these places, we engage other departments of our university. For example, in Ganso last week, we had the final exhibition of one of our photography students. And it's always um, presented within our chemis. Here also we take uh, exhibitions, for example, from local, um, local artists that can exhibit their art within our, our Ganso, but also our Fedora. And the final chemi of the hospitality department is Fly. This is our fashion vintage uh, shop that you can also find in the city center of Florence. And here you can find working our fashion students. They do uh, their experiential learning here in roles such as a personal styler or personal shopper. But you can also find a hospitality management student working here usually in courses such as consumer behavior, retail strategies, um, marketing, for example. So Fly, Ganso, and Fedora are the three main CEMIs, community engagement member institutions of the hospitality department. Then on top of that, each department has different CEMIs, but these are the ones that really concern, um, concern the hospitality department. This is where our students go to do their experiential learning. <clears throat> so let's talk about the community and the community that FUA creates. What's really interesting is that FUA, so it's not only CHEMIS, it's actually a community center that is supported by the city of uh, Firenze. What this means is that we have the direct support of the city and it makes it easier for us to really bring in together the community and the tourism side of it, or in our case, the, the exchange student side of it. Now, what is interesting about the Chemis is that they really incorporate both the locals and the exchange students and the tourists. So think about our, our students working there but our locals are mainly the main guest, the main client that enjoys our, our chemis. For example, in Fedora, of course, we serve our students. They are more than welcome to have lunch there. But if we look at who is our regular clientele, it's around 60, 70% local. Local people who work in the area, who live in the area, people who come in every single day of the week or people who come in every Saturday. And they have this interaction then between the students and the local community that benefits, of course, both. So like we said, um, the locals in Florence are looking more for this sort of tourism that has a little bit more respect for the local culture and the local ways. And this is where our students really get the chance, the opportunity to understand the Florentine culture and the Florentine life because they have this interaction with um, the local community. So they go from being exchange students to being um, actual Florentine people who are part of the community and part of everything that goes and comes um, co goes and comes with it. So it's a really interesting um, experience for them. Then on the other hand, you have the locals who benefit from this exchange with our with our exchange students and different cultures and different nat nat nationalities and uh, this broader perspective. Now, as a community center, we of course do a lot of um, events that bring the community within our school. For example, we do the exhibitions of local artists that are changed every three to four weeks. Sometimes they stay a little bit longer. And we do, for example, book readings. Um, every week now during the summertime, we have local uh, authors who do a book presentation of a book they have written within our community center. So we 
have really this opportunity to have loads of interesting events from the local community within our university, within our community center that helps to build this relationship between the students and the local, local people, the local community that we have here in Firenze. And this is something that is truly unique, um, truly unique for, for our school. It's something that I have not seen um, elsewhere. And it's what makes it the program so special. And it's also what makes it so interesting and fun for the students. Now I work in the front of house um, every day. So I work with all of the front of house students who do shifts at Fedora and um, Ganso. And we get a lot of feedback from these students on their experience. Now, of course, we also have students who don't do any experiential learning hours. But what I find with the students who do the experiential learning part is that when they leave Firenze, when they leave Italy, A, they have learned a lot more Italian. They can actually speak some Italian when they leave without necessarily taking any lessons. They have a broader understanding of the Italian um, culture and they feel more part of the school. They really feel integrated into the school because they have these hours, these experiences that they um, create and spend with, with, the, with the staff here. So it's a really fun way to become part of the Italian culture, to really start feeling more Florentine than, than a stranger, I would say. Um, I can sympathize with these students. They are, of course, leaving home, most of them for the first time. They are far away. Um, it's a culture shock. Everything is different. I was myself 18 when I first um, left the EU by myself. And what I personally found is that really creating a community for yourself, engaging in the culture, engaging in, the, in everything around you is what makes your stay more enjoyable. It fights the homesickness. It really gives you an opportunity to enjoy more and not necessarily be constantly bombarded by these different things that are scary because you are far away from home and maybe you have never been away from home before. So it's, uh, it's not only, I think, interesting from the sense of here's how they can communicate with the locals, but also on how they can feel safe and um, safer, yeah, I guess, in, in the changing culture and in the different environment that they are suddenly kind of thrown to. So this is truly um, the FUA mission. It's to have these um, possibilities, these opportunities for the students to engage in this experiential learning and in that way, integrate themselves within the local community and vice versa for the local community to have this relationship, this uh, broader experience with our international students. And that is um, that is FA, and that is the beauty of these uh, hospitality courses that we offer is that they truly are experiential learning. They are not just inside the classroom, even though that is a very important part of the learning. But it's that they are truly in the wild, so to speak. The students actually get the experience that will allow them to move forward when they when they graduate from our school, when they leave uh, the school. All our culinary students have worked in professional kitchens. All our hospitality management students have worked in, uh, in spas and in restaurants and in uh, hotels. It's a, it's, it's a really interesting opportunity for, for all of our students to get this experience. And that's it. Thank you so much. For listening to me grazie like we say in italian now i think there's time for some questions right yes thank you very much
I'm like, I feel like I learned a lot. <laughs> but yeah, I'll, I'll open it up for questions. Is there any? I'll um, check the chat. Yeah, I, I have a question. Um, what are the protocols right now for COVID in Italy? Do you have vaccinated people? And Yeah, so I think um, right now it's around 80% of the population is fully vaccinated. Right. Um, now, starting from 1st of May, you don't have any more the green pass or you don't have to wear masks or they basically you don't have any more regulations except in places such as universities where you still have to wear a mask. Yeah. But just it, to add on to that for we are our communications team in support of our student life and development team who provides uh, pre-departure information as well as information for being on the ground in addition to what Ida just shared the you know obviously when when folks need to and this wouldn't be necessarily the case of a, a visiting student but uh, for the locals here if you are to visit let's say um, certain medical spaces right like hospitals or hospices uh, care facilities um, there are green pass uh, so either vaccination or recovery requirement recovery requirements for masks on public transportation the Italian government wants um, any passengers to be utilizing um, the EU FFP2 mask, which basically is in US terms, our equivalent would be um, an N95. Um, FFP2 is simply a European designation. And so it indicates a level of protect protection. Obviously each country has its own codes for different types of masks. And so for example, the US would be an N95 in just to, Think about another example, South Korea. We have a lot of students from South Korea here. They um, have what's called the K94. They're all the same thing, basically. Mm -hmm. I think we have a question from Mary. Oh, yeah. What are the best months to visit Firenze? Off season, less crowded, yet still open? Yeah, um, <laughs> good question. Um, personally, I would say, October or then April because you usually have pretty good weather um, but you're outside of the summer summer heat because it does get um, very very hot here it gets to 36 degrees I don't know what that is actually in Fahrenheit over 100 over 100 and it is a very packed city in a valley so <laughs> it can get quite hot. And in the summer, we also have um, the main rush of tourists. So personally, I would say October, April, uh, it's a little bit quieter. Um, everything is still open and um, the weather is simply more uh, supportable. Now, of course, I'm from Finland. I like the cold. So <laughs> it depends how much heat you can take. <laughs> April is a very pretty month. You know, we're, we really are one of those cities where we have tourism year round. And uh, Ida's absolutely right when we think about the summer season being that peak moment uh, for tourists coming from abroad. However, you'll see throughout the year different waves and patterns of tourism uh, around some of the winter months between Christmas and the Epiphany, which is January 6th. You'll see a lot of Italian movement. Uh, within the national territory, people like to go travel to visit family and, you know, visit cities where one may have not been before. I mean, there really is no month without tourism in Florence, which makes the city such an interesting case study for the hospitality industry. You'll see different types of tourism, different types of demographics, different types of um, industry preferences throughout the year. And so all the more fun for, let's say, a student of hospitality to be in a city such as Florence, to be able to witness kind of the um, changing cycles, patterns, and evolution of tourism in any given period. Uh, that said, um, yes, April is a lovely month. Uh, October is a lovely month as well. I mean, fall in Florence, 
I mean, even phonetically, it sounds beautiful. But I have to say, I wouldn't rule out the month of January either. I've had a lot of, we've had a lot of folks tell us, you know, it is a little bit emptier, but not empty because again, you have the Italian families that like to travel around, you know, maybe a family from Milan or Naples, they're seeing relatives in Florence and, um, you know, Tuscany, which is the region that Florence is a capital of, um, tends to be a very visited and sought out location even for uh, other Italians, uh, as well as obviously Europeans um, who can very easily reach Florence and Tuscany in, in just uh, a couple hours or so. We really do have a year round tourism like um, February is the quietest month here when it comes to tourism. But then on the other hand, you have holidays such as Valentine's Day and um, Florence is seen, of course, as a very romantic city. So in February, for example, around Valentine's Day, you will see like a big um, amount of couples that are coming suddenly to visit uh, Florence. So you almost have this change of our main tourist profile for a long weekend. And then we go back to um, the normal profile of, of uh, a tourist in Firenze. I don't see any other questions, but I actually have one that came up when I was listening. Um, so I'm wondering about the, the money coming into Florence now that the, the demographics of tourism is changing. So one of the things you mentioned is like, well, the, the, the country people are coming from is changing and the age. And I remember traveling in Europe as a student in my 20s and I was trying to spend as little money as possible. So I'm wondering now that your demographics of who's coming into Florence as a tourist is also changing just how much funds are coming into Florence? Is that being tracked? So of course it's it's a lot less. Um, young people do um, spend a lot less money, but again, it's it is like the whole thing is changing because young people do now spend more money because mm. they have been cooped up at home um, for two years. So a lot of the people who have money to go travel after the pandemic who um, manage to keep their jobs and maybe save up during those two years, they actually have the money to spend. And since they have been inside, not traveling for two years, they are more willing to, to spend money in general. So of course it's less than a family of five would spend, but it is more than a young person two years ago who's backpacking through Europe would have, um, would have spent. Okay. Thank you. Okay, if anyone has any other questions for our, our guests. I'm always that person where as soon as we end a Zoom call, I have a question and it's too late. And so I just wanted to share with all of our COC um, participants here today, if you do have any other follow-up <laughs> questions, we're more than happy to have them forwarded to us uh, from the COC International Office. And, you know, we, we also wanted to thank you for hosting us today. It was, um, it's always a nice experience for us to be interacting with our colleagues and acquaintances abroad. And uh, the on behalf of our university relations department that I'm a part of, I also wanted to just really thank the international office and colleagues there for putting this together. Um, our relationship with COC started Oh, goodness, so I want to say two years ago, maybe. Um, we've been very diligent in terms of establishing the contact and then on a regular basis, um, meeting virtually, you know, because of COVID, uh, it had to be virtual. But um, I also see that Charlie Johnson is on the call and it was really thanks to this initial contact established uh, by Charlie um, that we were able to grow this relationship into a partnership and, and, and we've even had the pleasure of hosting a COC student um, for a semester in Florence. And so we're um, loving the evolution and the growth of the partnership and being able to participate in these uh, diversifying experiences. And so thank you. We really appreciate the opportunity. Yes, thank you a lot.
Well, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So I can I can I say so? Yeah. I don't I don't have any questions, but I'll be there in uh, I'll be in Split in June 11th, and then I'm going to Florence right after that. So I'm going to uh, look for I'm looking forward to going to Federa and um, and Gonzo to see your guys' um, sp spots. But do you know how I could watch Calcio Storico? I I've what never you, been. What are your dates, Charlie? Again? Uh, we start and split. I think we're there for seven days. So let's say June eighteenth to the end of uh, the end of to July tenth. Okay. So the they they do the matches as a playoff style, and so what I can tell you is that the final game is usually on the twenty fourth of June because that is in Italy. Every city has a different patron saint. And so, for example, you know, uh, we may have friends and colleagues in Rome and they have a holiday <laughs> for their saint who's different from ours. Florence in, in Turin, Torino, we have the same St. John. And so June 24th is that holiday, um, but the city is still active. It's bustling. I mean, it's um, right smack in the middle of the summer. So um, very important from a tourism perspective. What you could probably do is um, look it up online. Um, I will check out a couple of links and have, um, have we actually have a colleague who volunteers. Um, he, he's a rugby player um, when he's not, he's a full-time uh, employee here, but he's had a, a long standing relationship with the sport of rugby and he's actually a part of a semi-pro team. And so he has all the insider information. We'll get that and then send it over to you. Also, because we need to see from, I mean, again, going back to one of the original questions about COVID protocol, um, all that protocol is basically going away this summer, unless again, one needs to visit someone at a hospital, um, or let's say you're on public transport and, and need to be wearing a mask. But um, we know that the event will be open to the public. And so we'll try to find that information and send you um, a handy link. Thank you. Yeah, I, I do mixed martial arts. So for me, it's the, that's that's what Calcio Storico is to me. It's just mixed martial arts. It's just out there fighting. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's very hands-on football. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool. Thank you. All right, so I think um, we're close to time. I want to say thank you again for coming by um, for the presentation. I'll send you a link to the recording well, so you can share it with your students too if you'd like. And I just wanted to say that tomorrow we have our very own Kevin Anthony here from College of the Canyons who will be doing the presentation, same time, same Zoom link. So if people wanna join in, uh, tomorrow's presentation is rethinking the entire tourism experience. So uh, I'll say stay tuned for that. And of course, every day this week, we have a, a presentation at the same time and same link. So if we wanna come back, we encourage that. And I say thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.